So the National Archives and Records Administration has a specific role, and it's clear and simple. We're the nation's rec record keeper. We safeguard and preserve the records of our federal government and make them easily accessible to our citizens so that they can use, use them and learn from them. The records that come to us for accession into our permanent holdings represent only about 2 to 3 percent of all those created by the federal departments and agencies. And I can tell you it is 1 billion pages a day that come to us. And those are just the 2 to 3 percent that are of permanent records. But they're the most important records. Once upon a time and not so long ago, these records were all on paper and we provided access to them wherever they were located among the National Archives facilities around the country. 14 regional archives, 17 federal record centers, 13 presidential libraries, the National Personnel Records Center in St. Louis, and our facilities in Washington and College Park, Maryland. Over the years, many thousands, millions of people have come to these locations for genealogy information in the forms of ship records, immigration rolls, or Civil War pension files. Millions more contact our St. Louis facility for their military records to qualify for government benefits. Others consult the records of Congress we hold in Washington to enrich our understanding of representative government. And still others visit our presidential libraries to do research about one of the 13 presidential administrations for which we hold records. The National Archives has been and continues to be a leader in the online movement for greater access to primary legal materials. Already, we provide a large amount of these documents to our customers on the web. Since 1994, NARA's Office of the Federal Register and the Government Printing Office have provided primary legal materials to the public, the public and private laws of the United States, the United States statutes at large, the Daily Federal Register, and the Code of Federal Regulations. In 2008, the Federal Register began placing documents appearing on public inspection online, thereby providing the general public greater access to the documents that impact their daily lives. The Federal Register and GPO Partnership now offers bulk, bulk downloads of Federal Register and Code of Federal Regulations XML files to the general public via data.gov. Bulk downloads of this information are being used by the Legal Information Institute at Cornell and the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton in new and innovative ways to help citizens play a greater role in the rulemaking process. FedThread.org has been experimenting with user annotation in terms of making comments directly beside the text of Federal Reg Register documents, which could then be submitted as comments to the official site. GovPulse.us is also on the forefront of tran the transparency movement by making the Federal Register searchable, more accessible, and easier for the general public to participate in government. It's not only the private sector that benefits from bulk downloads. Providing this important legal information has created new opportunities for government, allowing us to develop new ways to display this information online. Executive branch agencies and departments send their important records to the archives according to record schedules. They are then available unless they fall under exemptions or exclusions in, under the Freedom of Information Act. But many executive branch agencies put policies, rulings, and opinions immediately on their websites long before such records are scheduled to come to NARA. It all forms a significant part of administrative law. Eventually, the most important of these documents will go into the Electronic Records Archive, or ERA, that we are building to hold all the federal government's electronic records. This includes both those that are born digital or traditional records that are digitized. The idea is to make these records accessible far into the future, free from dependency on any specific hardware or software. These records then will be accessible to the public at any time from anywhere in the world. The first phase of ERA ran from 2005 to 2008 and involved electronic records from four federal agencies, the Patent and Trademark Office, the National Nuclear Security Administration, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and the Naval Oceanographic Office. These agencies now use ERA. Later this year, the number of federal agencies that use ERA will be expanded from those four to about 30. At the end of the George W. Bush administration in January 2009, the ERA took in 77 terabytes of data from the executive office. That's about 320 million searchable objects. 
These records from the Bush administration will be available in accordance with the laws governing presidential records. Eventually, it will be mandatory for all federal agencies to move the permanent records to the ERA, which is on schedule to be fully op operational in 2012. The prime contractor on this project is Lockheed Martin, and during the four and a half days while the government was shut down in Washington, I had an opportunity to read the Lockheed contract for the first time, um, all 3,000 pages of it, uh, to see exactly what we had signed on for. This is a massive project, the most expensive, most visible, um, most complex um, technology project that I certainly have ever been involved in. So it's um, very important that I understand what it is that we signed on for to ensure that we um, deliver what's supposed to be delivered. Everything I've mentioned so far fits in well with our open government plan, which was created to comply with the President's open government directive. The President's directive calls for the creation of a culture of transparency, participation, and collaboration in and among federal agencies, the goal being to transform the way the government does business and the way people interact with the government. The thinking behind open government is the essence of the work we do every day, rooted in the belief that citizens have the right to see, examine, and learn from the records of their government. Our open government plan goes further. It strengthens the culture of open government within the National Archives. It strengthens transparency in the workplace. It provides leadership and services to enable the federal government to meet the challenges of the next century. And important to our discussion today, to develop web and data services to meet our 21st century needs. We will continue to contribute data to data.gov. So far, we have posted the Federal Register from 2000 to date, the Code of Federal Regulations from 2007 through 2009, and descriptives, descriptions from our archival research catalog dating back from 2002. These descriptions now cover about 60%, 65% of all the holdings of the National Archives. We plan to leverage the internet to make our records more easily available. Our website, search capabilities, digitization strategies, and our use of social media to engage the public must be able to make, meet these needs. One of the things that will be different will be the Federal Register. We're going to relaunch it as a daily web newspaper for the 21st century. The new Federal Register will guide its readers to the articles and topics that are most popular and relevant to their lives. It will have individual sections for money, environment, world, science and technology, business and industry, and health and public welfare. This new approach will also highlight proposed and final rules that have significant impact on the U.S. economy or raise important regulatory policy issues. Also, the new Federal Register will post a calendar of events constantly updated to list public meetings all over the country, including those that offer webcasts and remote call-in options. The calendar will also track the opening and closing of comment periods and the dates of rules going into effect. Users with an, internet, with an interest in a particular agency can easily follow each day's documents, as well as the most popular documents issued <coughs> in the past. Statistics and visualizations will track agency activity over time. Other innovative tools will appear in the new Federal Register, one of them being a regulatory timetable that pinpoints where a regulatory action stands in the official process and links to previous proposed rules and related notices. For those new to rulemaking, the site will also offer tutorials, articles from academic contributors, and access to government document librarians. The new Federal Register will go beyond just reading about government rules. It will help people participate in the government, one of the major goals of the Open Government Initiative. Each document that asks for public comments will feature a highly visible button for submitting direct comments directly to the official agency site. If a reader wants to share news and comment, opportunities with friends or interest groups. The document will include a feature for sending email and posting to social networking sites. At the same time, we'll be redesigning our public website to maximize public participation, as well as to develop streamlined search capabilities. We intend for our entire website, as well as access to our holdings online, to be user -focused, a user-focused community experience. Furthermore, we intend to explore ways to develop our current catalog into a social catalog that allows our online users to contribute information to descriptions of our records. And those of you who have caught my blog, AOTIS, uh, will see an interesting conversation going on about my concept of the citizen archivist. 
and a fair amount of pushback from the professional archivists about giving away the store um, to the general public. Um, I've always, my, my experience has always been that we learn more about our collections when we talk to the people who are using the collections, and those people walk out the door with all this wonderful content. So this is a way of capturing some of that content. So stay tuned. Our open government plan is posted on our website, and I encourage you to take a look at it. Your comments and suggestions are, are most welcome. And if you have a comment for me, you can um, check out my blog. And I'd be happy to hear from you about the law.gov project or any archives issue. We are poised to open up government more for its citizens, and that, of course, means having a dialogue with those citizens. So I'd be happy to talk more about that. Thank you. Questions happy to for answer you. any questions. I have one. Um, can you tell us a little bit about things that were surprises to you, things that were surprisingly easy or surprisingly <coughs> hard uh, in your attempts to open things up, and any reflections on what we can learn from those surprises, on those, those things that worked easily and were pushing downhill, low-hanging fruit, those things that were extremely difficult and where it seemed almost impossible to, to change the way things were done? A lot of it, I, th I would say, has to do with the culture of government. Um, and I'm just reflecting on my, my own agency. Um, and it was a, a, a similar to my um, experience when I walked into the New York Public Library, an attitude that we've always done, we've always done it this way. Why would we um, ask anyone? Why would we look elsewhere for solutions to problems? Um, those kinds of things. A lot of staff have been in place for a very long time. Um, and a, a level of um, insularity, I would say, that um, was uh, pervasive. Um, the, I, I've put a lot of stock in the President's Open Government Directive because this was an opportunity, rather than uh, a tops-down approach, a bottoms-up approach, to rethink how we go about doing our business to make um, not only the agency, um, but our work much more transparent, much more collaborative, and much more participative. So it allowed me to identify a layer of staff within the organization who'd never had an opportunity to, um, to shine, um, and, to, and to charge them with coming up with the open government plan for the agency. And, and the culture um, has already begun to shift. Um, I discovered, um, two months ago, I discovered the social media working group of the National Archives, which had been meeting in secret because it was, <laughs> was not authorized. It had not, not been authorized. And I, the private social media. I caught wind of this and walked into their meeting and sat down with them. 25 people who um, are the most creative folks in the National Archives so far that I've met, um, with the most creative ideas um, that have been unleashed, um, um, basically. So that was... Um, I, I was not prepared for the depth of the um, conservative um, bureau bureaucracy. That doesn't mean that we've, we've solved all those problems, but um, the message is clear now after five and a half months that, that things are different, will be different uh, in the archives. So just to follow up, if I could, on that, one, that's one of the things that we sort of study here at the center, this idea of sort of cultural agoraphobia, that we always see very accurately the dangers of opening things up and oversee them, and we underestimate the positive things. We, 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 you know, the idea of the internet, the idea of Wikipedia, the idea of open source software, these are all things just like, they sound ludicrous if you imagine yourself you know, 15, 17 years ago. And then they come, and the question is, but do we learn from them? Do we generalize, or do we think, well, that's special, that's a weird, special thing. Obviously, when you talk about the idea of a citizen archivist, you are challenging a priesthood in both the good and bad senses of that word, right? The, the idea of that we are, we actually, ha we take as a serious obligation going back through history, the idea of preserving the archive, and you want to let in the hordes. What, often people are not convinced by arguments, but by concrete examples. What concrete examples do you try and point them to, to say, look, we can do this and it won't be as bad as you think? We had a great example. Last Friday afternoon, we had a meeting. Uh, I meet about I meet once a quarter with uh, 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 the research group, the folks who come to the archives and do research. So they, anyone who wants to come to this open meeting comes, and I met, and we, and I presented the citizen archivist concept to get some reaction from them. They were they were excited. I mean, they were beside themselves thinking about um, things that they had discovered in the collection. And one guy stood up, and he had just this week found a George Washington letter 
and a Revolutionary War diary in pension files. We, we didn't know they were there. We had no idea. You know, we've got 10 billion things in the archives. T literally, 10 billion things. We're never going to know everything that we have in the, in, the, in the collection. So he's going to be our first citizen archivist. Um, he's going to be featured on my blog next week. <laughs> so sharing those kinds of discoveries. And there were, the, there were three or four staff members in this. And when they heard this, they were, oh, wow. Yeah, so. Telling stories is, I think, the best way. Other questions? The other thing that you asked me about challenges, the other thing um, that I wasn't prepared for was the level of classified information that I'm dealing with. Uh, another mandate from the, from the White House at the end of December was the creation of the National Declassification Center. Um, by the end of 2013, I have to have declassified or reviewed for declassification uh, more than 400 million pages of, of content. Um, there's another <laughs> <laughs> we have um, in the federal government there are something like 254 agencies. Um, within those agencies, there are more than 2,400 different separate classification guides in operation. So we've got this massive problem of uh, varying degrees of standards and implementation of classification rules that that we really have to uh, streamline and work through. Um, one of the issues with law.gov is obviously going forward and, and getting current materials, but one of the other issues is scanning the back file for primary legal materials. And by that I mean Supreme Court briefs, yeah. uh, congressional hearings, back issues of the CFR. Um, do you have any idea how big that problem is? And if not, might the National Archives <laughs> be able to help us um, determine the, the scope of that across the three branches of the federal government? We need to talk. Okay. <laughs> that, would, that would be useful um, information because yes. when we go to Congress and say, here is the scope of your yep. problem. Um, yep. Great, thanks. Happy to talk. And some of these things, Supreme Court briefs, for example, are, are available from commercial vendors, but they're very, very expensive. Right. Um, and presumably in the archives, you have copies of Supreme Court briefs. So All of them. I hope. Um, All of them. Jonathan? <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jonathan Wiener from Duke Law School and a former OSTP staffer. Uh -huh. But, uh, and my question may be more general than, than just for you, but I thought you might have particular insights. The current, this month's issue of Harvard Magazine has on its cover something like the end of the library, and it's oh, really? about the, the internet putting pressure on university libraries, even as, as a gigantic a library system as Harvard's. Bob Darton. Pardon? Bob Darton. I'm not sure. An article no, by Bob Darnett. No, he didn't write it. He did not write it. No. Not write it. He's but, quoted in it. Oh, okay. So my question, yes. and if someone has, if you've already discussed this earlier today, I uh, with I wasn't with, here earlier today, question, so, so this is fresh. But just you know, what, what do you think is the, <laughs> the future? Of the what library? do you think of, of that? Of the of the changing role of the library, including nonprofit university libraries, municipal libraries, but also what's the role of the government's um, archives and Library of Congress and so forth in responding. Um, to the, the potential pressure on the non-governmental or, or non-federal libraries? Um, I, th I think it's having spent my entire life in the research library environment and having watched uh, the role that technology plays throughout those, um, that my career, it's clear to me that, that the future of libraries is heavily dependent upon um, technology, that, all, that at some point, I won't live to see it, at some point all the content will be available electronically. We already, you already know this, those of you who are in the classroom, that if it isn't in electronic form, your students aren't finding it, they're not using it. There's no such thing as paper, um, uh, to most undergraduates anyway. Um, so the more we can do uh, as a uh, community of getting as much content uh, into their hands, eyes, minds as possible is, is the role that, that we should be playing. As the archivist of the United States, my goal is to get all 10 billion of my items in digital form. However, I can do that. Working with Carl, working with, um, I'm about to have some conversations with Google, um, ways that we can get um, all of that content um, accessible. Um, I can't speak for the Library of Congress. That's a whole um, uh, <laughs> uh, different situation. Um, um, they have a very different mission than, than, than I do. I'm, I'm now focused on my records. 
Can I, one follow up on that? One of the things we were talking about this morning was the danger of um, deals <coughs> when government um, needs to bring in a private vendor to yeah. make accessible materials yeah. and is very focused on one kind of access. You know, I need to put it up online and then makes a deal which. I'm not happy with that at all, and I can, and Carl knows this. Um, we have some arrangements with some commercial vendors um, like Ancestry.com and Family History for genealogical materials. So they have come in and scanned uh, massive amounts of material from our collection, and they have the archives before my time uh, signed a standard digitization contract. This is fairly standard now in the in the business of a five-year lock on the content. Uh, I'm, this is, you know, these are government records we're talking about. I'm not happy with this. 